Okay, folks, did we all get the recording? Did we all get the little notification? Beautiful. All right. Well, again, folks, thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank you for attending tonight. This is going to just be, again, an amazing opportunity to hear from our newly elected legislators. Um, and it's, again, it's just, oh, excuse me. Hold on, folks. Okay, sorry about that, folks. So again, it's just another amazing opportunity to hear from our legislators and to again prioritize our environmental our environmental concerns. But before I get started, I want to take an opportunity to thank our amazing co-sponsors that we have with us here tonight. Um, firstly, I'd like to introduce Ezra Thrush. He is our Vice President of Government Affairs with Penn Future. Ezra, you can go ahead. Hey, thanks so much, Maria, and thanks everybody for being here tonight. Uh, it's great to have uh, Senator Miller and Rep Siegel here tonight. Um, as Maria said, I work in government affairs for Penn Future. We're the state affiliate for the National Wildlife Federation. We do a lot of work on advocacy around clean air, clean energy, and clean water in particular, but we do a lot of work on a host of energy, environmental, agriculture, conservation issues across the Commonwealth. My office is based here in Harrisburg. It's just across the street from the state capitol building in downtown Harrisburg. We have offices across the Commonwealth. We have an office in downtown Pittsburgh, Center City, Philadelphia. Uh, we opened up one in uh, Erie just before the pandemic began. And we have an office in East Stroudsburg, which we just moved to uh, late last year. Uh, so we have a presence across the Commonwealth. And the legislature, we do a lot of work with the state legislature, the state legislators, the governor's office, uh, staffers who work in the executive branch agencies and the secretaries at the agencies uh, that intersect with uh, clean air and clean water and land. Uh, so just a few of our priorities uh, the next couple of years. On the energy side, we're really trying to expand opportunities and incentives for clean energy and renewable energy. Uh, there's something called the alternative energy portfolio standards. I won't break it down too much for you tonight, but we want to expand incentives for solar and wind in Pennsylvania. And we're also trying to protect a new rule that got went into effect last spring to reduce our carbon pollution in Pennsylvania. It's called the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative or Carbon Trading Credit Program in Pennsylvania that a lot of uh, environmental folks and advocates like yourselves worked hard to get done over the last couple of years. On the water side of things, we're really looking for increasing some dedicated and permanent funding for clean water programs and implementing conservation practices across the Commonwealth. We just got some pretty significant wins in last year's state budget, but we still have a long way to go yet, and we have significant funding gaps. So we're going to keep asking our legislatures in Harrisburg to work on finding some permanent funding source uh, for water programs. We want to keep pushing for full share funding for our river basin commissions. We believe in making sure that our uh, Delaware River Basin Commission, uh, which is the agency that protects the Delaware River near, uh, near these districts in the Lehigh Valley and all the tributaries that run into the Delaware are protected and restored. And we want to focus on making sure that the agencies, uh, the state level agencies have the tools that they need to do their jobs. So we're going to be pushing for increasing staffing at DEP, for instance, and increasing funding for DEP and DCNR. So with that, I'll kick it back to you, Maria. Looking forward to working with you, Senator Miller, uh, Representative Siegel, and all the other advocates here tonight in Lehigh Valley. Thanks, Maria. All right. Thank you so much, Ezra. Uh, next, I'd like to introduce Flora Cordoni, the field director for Penn Environment. Go ahead, Flora. Thank you so much, Maria, and hello, everyone. I'm so happy to be here. Um, as you just heard from Maria, my name is Flora Cardoni, and I'm the field director with Penn Environment. I'm also our point person for our work in the Lehigh Valley because I uh, used to live in Bethlehem and Allentown, so I'm extra excited to be here tonight in that respect. Um, but as many of you know, and some of you might not, Penn Environment is a statewide people-powered environmental advocacy organization. We have members and volunteers all over the state in every corner, including in the Lehigh Valley. We were founded under the idea and work under the idea that everyone should have clean air to breathe, clean water to drink, beautiful protected parks and open spaces to enjoy, and a safe and livable climate. 
powered by 100% clean renewable energy. And we work to make that vision a reality by working with all of you, mobilizing citizen support from across the state, helping to give the public a voice in the environmental debate so that we can really push good policies to the finish line and win real results for our environment and our climate here in the Commonwealth. Um, and of course, there's a lot to do um, at the state level and here in the Lehigh Valley. You know, the greater Lehigh Valley is some of the most beautiful natural places in Pennsylvania that we don't want to take for granted. We know that climate change is here with more extreme uh, weather causing flooding and destruction, hotter temperatures, meaning more smog and air pollution. And when Penn Environment tested nearby waterways, including the Lehigh River, Le Little Lehigh, Stocking Creek, and others, we found microplastic particles in every single one of these high-value pristine waterways um, that look to the eye untouched but actually have plastic pollution. So it's clear that we have work to do to protect our open spaces, tackle climate change, reduce the flow of single-use plastics, and more. Uh, there are so many things we can do to protect our environment and climate. There are certainly exciting opportunities in the legislature this session. So everyone at Penn Environment is so excited to work with Senator Miller and Rep Siegel in the legislature this session and work with all of you to protect our environment and climate. So thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to work with you moving forward. All right, thank you so much for our last co-sponsor, Emily Gale, the director with Civic Engage, the director, excuse me, for Civic Engagement for Democracy for All, was unfortunately unable to attend tonight. Um, but Do Democracy for All does work to protect public health, restore and protect natural resources, and move Pennsylvania towards a clean mm -hmm. energy future. Their team litigates cases before regulatory bodies and in local, state, and federal courts. And they advance legislative action on a state and federal level, providing public education and assist citizens in public advocacy. So again, though Emily was able, unable to attend, I do thank them for their work in co-sponsoring our event tonight. And now I'd like to introduce Katie Bloom, the political and legislative director for Conservation Voters of PA to introduce our main guest tonight. So Katie, go ahead. Yes, I am excited to introduce our main guest tonight, um, one of whom I have actually known for a good while. Um, so uh, just a brief thing on conservation voters. Most of uh, folks know us as the statewide political voice for the environment, and we work really hard to elect environmentally responsible candidates to state and local offices, advocate for those strong environmental policies, and frankly, to hold um, elected officials accountable through our cycle of accountability. And a lot of folks know us from our work on the Pennsylvania Environmental Scorecard, which we partner with with Sierra Club Clean Water Action and Clean Air Action. So a little bit about CVPA. But as an introduction for our special guests this evening, I do want to lift up Senator Miller began his political career in 2019 when he was elected to the Allentown School Board, uh, was vice president of the school board and has always sought to engage stakeholders and is really looking forward to being a leader in Harrisburg and also on environmental issues with a real understanding that Pennsylvania does have an environmental rights amendment that should be protecting all of us and our natural resources. Representative Josh Siegel uh, is the representative for the 22nd Legislative District in Lehigh County. Uh, he was chief of staff um, for the County Controller's Office, really helped work on transparency, uh, making the office as accessible as possible to everybody, and worked directly with the County Controller to bring some reforms, including some environmental sustainability um, especially around some spending and things like that. But a really, really cool thing that I want to lift up about both, which is really big news, that was announced today by both Representative Siegel and Senator Miller, um, as well as Representative Schweier and Schlossberg, is a huge chunk of grants that were awarded uh, locally there for all of you. And I just wanna highlight some things. And these are some things that our state elected officials can do and why we do these meet and greets is there's a grant to the Museum of Indian Culture for part of the Lenape Village uh, Park and Trail. There's help to South Whitehall Township to even just do a water leak 
correlator. Things like that can be really helpful to local municipalities to protect our water resources. And a few other things. So Representative Siegel and Senator Miller are already in Harrisburg um, out there helping the community and bringing, bringing some things back to the district to really help on on some environmental protection issues. So welcome and thank you for joining us. Maria? Absolutely well said, Katie, thank you so much. And now I get to stop talking for a little bit uh, and I get to turn it over first, introducing Senator McMiller, please take it away. Thank you, Maria, and thank you. Really excited to be here. Uh, you know, I look forward and extend the, the invitation to each and every uh, group we have on uh, to sit down individually with my office um, you know, I, I didn't get to meet you during the campaign, but definitely want to have a, a solid relationship going forward. Um, born and raised here in, in Allentown and uh, served on the Allentown School Board, went to Penn State, studied finance, and then worked at IBM in project management. Um, environmentally, recently, I, I climbed Mount Kilimanjaro to raise uh, funds for the Allentown School District. Um, I've done the sojourn, if anybody's familiar with, on the Lehigh River um, and and. Uh, really want to make sure that we're thinking regionally. My, my district represents the middle part of the Lehigh Valley going up to Jacobsburg State Park um, and, and Bushkill Township all the way down to Salisbury and Emmaus. Um, so I so want to think regionally, how do we keep our uh, the Lehigh Valley clean and, and, and the air clean and, and the environment safe? Um, and, and really looking forward to sitting down with our stakeholders and, and making sure that we're uh, making our environments protected moving forward. I appreciate that. Thank you, Senator Miller. Uh, but now, Representative Siegel. Thank you, uh, Maria, and thank you for everyone for putting this together. And I want to extend the same invitation for all of the groups present to coordinate and work with my office on any number of environmental issues. Um, I was on Allentown City Council for three years. I was elected in 2019. Nick and I uh, came up together in, in local office. Um, on Allentown Council, I was proud to be the council liaison to our Environmental Advisory Commission here in the city. So we did a lot of great work around uh, analyzing the city's carbon footprint and the different ways that we contributed to environmental deg uh, degradation. Uh, we looked at, you know, uh, what our carbon output was is from a facility standpoint and how our buildings contributed to, uh, you know, climate change from an energy consumption standpoint. Um, and in my role as chief of staff to the controller, uh, I was particularly interested in and uh, proud to work on a number of policy reports around how the county could be more environmentally sustainable. So in my time in the controller's office, um, the controller and I authored a report about how the county could do, enter into a power purchase agreement where we would derive all of our energy from either wind or solar, uh, making the county a leader in renewable energy creation and production here in the valley. Um, we also talked about how the county could create not only a jobs program around composting, but reduce its carbon footprint with, in terms of the food waste uh, that we produce so generally speaking, uh, about 30% of the waste that prisons produce is food waste. We produced about 25,000 tons of waste a year, which is the equivalent of about 35 um, homes energy consumption in a given year. And so the controller and I had put together a report about how the county of Lehigh could not only enter into a compost, uh, composting program for our inmates, but also create jobs um, around environmental sustainability. So those are two reports that I authored in the controller's office, and that was something I did in my capacity as chief of staff. Um, and now in Harrisburg, I'm looking to apply the pragmatism of my local office that I once held um, to some of the things I think we can do to strengthen and help municipalities be leaders uh, in sustainability. Um, as someone that's watched uh, you know, and, and voted on budgets where we talked about infrastructure improvements in Allentown, I want to make sure that cities are leaders in the way we pave our streets with more permeable surfaces to recharge our groundwater and reduce stormwater runoff. That's always been a historic issue in Allentown. Um, and with climate change in the Lehigh Valley getting worse, uh, we need to make sure that we are a partner in the Commonwealth and assisting our municipalities embracing that for that by helping them plan strategically and making sure that they have the resources to modernize their facilities and make them environmentally sustainable while also creating union jobs, uh, making sure that the types of infrastructure that we lay are are environmentally sustainable and environmentally conscious, and, and most importantly, uh, making sure that our municipalities are uh, not given unfunded mandates. Uh, you know, one of the biggest issues is that we have a stormwater fee here in the city of Allentown um, because we have to make a lot of these necessary improvements. And I want to make sure that this, the state of Pennsylvania is doing its fair share um, in making its sizable investment in ensuring that our communities are safe and sustainable. I love the Valley. Um, one of my favorite things about the Valley is the trail networks. I run them, I jog them, I hike them. 
Uh, and so I want to make sure that we continue to invest in our natural resources and most importantly that we hold folks accountable. Um, and I couldn't agree more with the need to make sure that our Department of Environmental Protection has, above all else, the necessary personnel to hold polluters and violators of the law accountable uh, when they damage our streams and pollute our waterways. So uh, thank you, and I look forward to the rest of this town hall. All right. No, I, I appreciate that. Thank you so much. So just uh, one one question. One question we have, and folks, please remember, if you have any questions, please put them in the chat box because I know I certainly have quite a few. So uh, one thing that comes to mind um, and one thing that I was passed was uh, with th there's a lot of increasing flooding, right? With climate change, that is something that we, we certainly come to expect. But with that increase in flooding, we also have to acknowledge that maybe our infrastructure or, you know, our stormwater management systems may not exactly be up to par. Um, is there any plan to update our antiquated stormwater or flooding systems? Yeah, I mean, I can jump right in. Uh, so I, I met with the county and there's definitely a need for investment. Uh, so the current stormwater system isn't sufficient. Um, and we, we've seen that. Um, a lot of the, the warehouses we've seen are drawing a lot of water on our, our certain wells, especially in the, the central part of Leigh County. Um, so there's going to be significant investment needed. Um, and, and I don't think that the local municipalities are going to have the resources to step up and do that. So um, it's one of the first meetings we took it was with the county and, and, and different municipalities was understanding that need. Um, they did send over a 10-year capital improvement plan that they're just in the beginning stages of. Um, so we're just kind of analyzing how we can help erosion control is another one in terms of flooding, uh, of, you know, how we can help our parks and around our river systems as well. So, Josh, I don't know if you want to add anything to that. No, I think I think you covered it well, Senator. I think that that's the state needs to make sure that it's an active partner in helping municipalities develop those plans uh, and modernize them. And like I said, I, I think I alluded to earlier. Um, making sure that we are being responsible when it comes to development. I'm a big advocate for smart growth and making sure that the way we develop our communities, we do so with uh, you know a mindset of how they affect physical place and the environment. And so when we're building large you know facilities and removing permeable surface, um, I think cities and, and boroughs and townships have a really big role to play uh, in terms of making sure that we are you know creating more permeable surface where you know, we're planting sufficient vegetation to absorb stormwater runoff and additional rainfall, um, you know, that there's modernization of stormwater retention ponds, uh, you know, things like that, uh, to make sure that we are, you know, preventing stormwater runoff from carrying harmful toxins and pollutants into our waterways, so. And you know what, following up, just going a little deeper, I see um, in the chat a question from Destiny, um, you know, what are some of the safety plans during floods? And thinking about not just that, but um, you know, what are folks doing to improve uh, education, air, and water pollution? Well, education might be a little, a little off for today, but great question, Destiny. Great questions. I well, I think uh, I, I don't know if the senator wants to jump in first. Um, I okay. think. Well, actually, I think, you know, I think when we talk about it, I, I to probably just briefly address education, I have to commend the senator. Uh, he just had Senator Vincent Hughes, uh, you know, minority appropriations chair in the Senate come to the Allentown School District. And I think when we talk about education and, and health or pollution, um, I think that's something we don't often talk about in terms of making sure that we remediate and fix our school buildings, um, which often do have asbestos in them, you know, and in many ways contribute to environmental degradation and, and, and energy and efficiency. A lot of the buildings in Pennsylvania, especially school buildings, are extraordinarily old. Um, you know, they don't consume energy efficiently. There's opportunities there for solarization. And so I, I think uh, I have to commend the senator because I do think uh, there's a pollution component to that that we don't talk about. Um, these are huge public facilities. You know, school districts are often some of the biggest developers in municipalities. They're always building new, you know, structures. Making sure that those structures are built in a way that they contribute to a sustainable future is important. Um, I think the other thing we can do when it comes to smart growth is, you know, working with municipalities here in the Commonwealth and especially here in the Lehigh Valley to encourage multi-municipal planning. Um, you know, the Planning Commission has been very adept at that, making sure that municipalities plan their zoning together, which allows us to reduce the number of warehouses or large industrial facilities that are being built. And when you look at what's contributing to the air pollution of the valley, it's almost certainly the significant increase in truck traffic and congestion on our roadways. And we need to have strike a healthy balance. And I think 
you know, the most important thing we can do as a state is encourage and create incentives for municipalities to work together to collaborate on their zoning uh, so that we can build smarter mixed use development that's got a greater emphasis on manufacturing and, re and, and environmentally sustainable residential and not necessarily these big box warehouses that consume a lot of space. And, um, you know, and I think what we can also do is make sure that when those warehouses are built, that they, you know, that their roofs are covered in solar panels, that, the, you know, the Planning Commission just had a really great uh, forum at Lehigh University where they talked about how warehouses can be at really can be a, a part of the environmental solution if they're built with the right guidelines and standards. And so I think that that's also got to be part of the discussion as well. We're going to build these warehouses. There should be, you know, some standards or partnerships in place to make sure that they're built in a way that, you know, the Valley does not suffer. Um, they create jobs without a doubt, uh, but we need to make sure that they also are a part of that sustainable future. I don't, that that's where I come at it from. I don't know if the Senator has any additional things that he would like to add. Uh, I mean, just uh, my top priority is education, so I, I have to speak on that. Um, one thing we use, utilized some of the, the COVID dollars for the, the local school district downtown uh, was upgrading the energy efficiency of our buildings, um, and, and that really is going to pay dividends. I mean, some simple things as like up, updating to LED lights, uh, and even and then more in depth in terms of looking at solar fields for the school district. Uh, I just helped the Allentown School District apply for a, a federal grant for a school district solar field. Um, and, and they consume a lot of energy, the school district, to heat and cool all these older buildings and um, older facilities is something that I've been looking to address because of what uh, Representative Siegel said, you know, fill with lead and asbestos. And, and these are, you know, the future of tomorrow is learning in these buildings. And a lot of them are more than 100 years old and are, are just, you know, we've gotten the, the taxpayers have gotten the use out of them and, and it's time to, to upgrade these facilities because it, you're paying twice to renovate um, an older school building. So making sure that our, our school district across the Commonwealth, because there's 500, um, are, are, have an energy efficiency plan, I, I think is something that, uh, you know, we, we've talked about and we're, we're gonna continue to look into. Excellent. Fix. Thank you. And Destiny, great questions. And, and th uh, thinking of warehouses, um, Ellen asks, do the warehouses have to chip in to fund the remediations for their environmental impacts? Great question, Ellen. I don't think there's a specific fee, but that's something that we'll have to look into. A, a lot of times when they develop, uh, especially the larger ones, they have an environmental plan, but it's not as comprehensive as it should be. And it's a lot of times we see like the FedEx facility in, in the Lehigh Valley that's built by the airport, the truck traffic, you know, they address the street, the road in front of it, but what does the traffic do going on the airport road and then 22, that's kind of uh, left that out of, out of the conversation. So uh, we'll definitely look into how we can talk about the environmental impact and, and to Representative Siegel's point, I mean, these warehouses and industrial buildings, not that to continue to pick on them, but they should have solar panels on, the, on their roofs. They, we should be pushing some more uh, stricter in, environmental uh, rules in their construction, you know, so that we're planning ahead. Okay. And just thinking again, keeping with the warehouses. So we are seeing this uh, this over well this new development. Is there any plans to uh, preserve to preserve lands to make sure that they don't become overdeveloped or that we're protecting um, our our farmers that we're protecting um, you know animal habitats things like this? Yes. Yeah, so our district uh, in northern Northampton very agricultural. So. Uh, making sure that we're protecting our farmland across the Lehigh Valley is very important. But as we've been meeting with stakeholders, it's come up a, a decent amount. And both the Lehigh and Northampton County has been, have been doing a great job preserving farmland. Um, and I think there could be some additional incentives from the state uh, in, in terms of protecting those that, that land. Um, and we've also seen that the municipalities should have updated zoning, as the representatives mentioned, that you know there's 20 municipalities in our district. They, they don't have to be all accommodating all different kinds of zoning uses. Uh, and lastly, uh, we've been working on a proposal to the industrial site reuse program that uh, environmentally remediates and contaminants from industrial sites that have been used to reuse those current parcels so that we're preserving using green space and farmland 
why don't we use the, uh, for example, the Lehigh Valley Dairy site on MacArthur Road, if you're familiar. Great site, great location. We should be using that and investing in that site versus farmland uh, or green space that's out there. Representative Siegel. Yeah, I think Senator Miller brings up an excellent point, and that is that, you know, there's a great deal of open space in the valley. And I, and I, as a, you know, I used to work for Lehigh County, obviously, and Lehigh County is one of the leading counties in the Commonwealth when it comes to farmland preservation. Um, I do think the state could be a bigger partner perhaps in helping subsidize that to some extent and amplifying the efforts of counties that are doing a great job. Um, but to the Senator's point about making, making more responsible use of some of the existing land that we have, um, there are tremendous amounts of brown fields in the valley and also gray fields. And I'm working on a bill right now uh, that would create a system of state and local incentives to help revitalize blighted old shopping plazas. Um, you know, I think no matter where you drive around the Commonwealth, you can't help but see an old shopping mall or shopping plaza that's well past its prime. And I'd rather see concentrated development um, in those areas where they were already accustomed to traffic and, and large concentrations of folks rather than building brand new um, on a, you know, a parcel of land that's green or that's, you know, that's that's not currently being appropriated for any use. Um, I think we need to be smarter about how we develop. Again, I, I'm very, a big, I'm a tremendous proponent of smart growth, smart development, creating more dense, mixed use, walkable communities where people have access to, you know, robust public transit, where folks live, work, and, and shop in their own neighborhood, which cuts down on cars and additional traffic. The more that we can move our society towards those really well-built, well-structured neighborhoods, um, and make better use of existing facilities and sites that have, you know, kind of been out past their, uh, you know, out past their prime. I think that's the way that we make sure that we don't keep building out. Um, one of the things I hate most, uh, especially as an urban rep, is suburban sprawl. Um, you know, that has really destroyed, I, frankly, the country over the last 30 years is the fact that we've built out in this rapacious desire to just sort of consume and consume. And I think the state has a huge role to play, and we've seen it across the country, um, in realigning the incentives around dense mixed use, you know, smart development, um, where folks are, you know, next to their employment, where the, you know, they can literally walk to work, walk to the grocery store, uh, where public transit is widely available. Um, so that, that's sort of my, uh, that, that's sort of where I come at it from. I think they're both important, brown fields, gray fields. And um, Representative Siegel, if I may interject, we just had sure. a clarification question. Could you please explain what a gray field is versus a brown field? Yeah, and it looks like Katie just addressed it as well. Um, you know, gray fields, uh, as she said, are, are like, you know, typically places with lots of old parking lot space. Um, and the nice thing about redeveloping them is we can add additional green space to what was once a place that, uh, you know, especially when you think of a shopping mall, an old shopping mall, right? Um, you know, there's a lot of parking in America, right? Like, there, I think it's like there's something like four or five spaces for every car or something like that. So we're over parked in America. One of the things that makes our development so inefficient is actually mandatory minimums on parking makes us very auto centric as a society. And so the more we can reduce that, especially with transit oriented development, the better. Um, but one of my ambitions is to take a lot of these old gray fields where you've got parking space and everything um, and turn them into really vibrant communities where folks are, you know, walking and it's accessible um, with a particular emphasis on making sure that we're ripping up a lot of that old asphalt and we're adding green space parks community areas um, folks where people can you know places where folks can gather um, and then obviously the, a brownfield is usually an old industrial site where there's been a tremendous amount of like chemicals leached into the ground and so that they're they're different types of projects they require different types of incentives um, but i think they're both important for the commonwealth to invest in because we've got a lot of them and we really underutilize them um, in terms of development Okay, fantastic. Thank you. Can, and, um, can I, oh, go ahead. I, I just saw a question on the DNL tra trail between Northampton and, and Allentown. Uh, so if you're okay, I'll can I answer oh, you, that. Right? You can go right ahead. <laughs> yeah. so, so I know that, so Norfolk Southern owns some of the, the parcels, um, and I know everybody's familiar with them because of their current train accident, yes. Uh, but they they own some of their uh, the current parcels that the county's trying to uh, purchase um, so we're, we were on the phone with the county yesterday talking about uh, contacts at North Polk, so we can work on that. We did just get a, a grant for Hanover Township for adding to their part of the DNL chip trail. Actually, we were uh, this afternoon with Hanover and told them that. Um, so that's definitely something that we're, we're getting close to, but it just kind of is, the final pieces always seem to be uh, the hardest. And, and, you know, a lot of this groundwork was laid years ago by uh, Representative Schlossberg and, and Schweier. Uh, so 
So we've got to you know, give kudos to them and hopefully, and Josh, if you correct me if I'm wrong, you've got the waterfront project, which will have a nice uh, walking trail as well. And Bucky Boyle Park is something that um, I, I think lacks investment right now. And I'm I, uh, looking at grant opportunities to invest in that. It's a very uh, centric location. So just had to jump in there. The DNL trail is awesome. So. Oh, I love it. That is that is why we're here. This is what we're doing. I love it. Okay. So question from Aaron. So what's being done to reduce or eliminate plastic shopping bags? Um, what about other single use plastics? Uh, I don't know that there, I'm, I'm not sure what, what sort of action is. I, I know several years ago, there was a bill that would preempt municipalities from being able to pass their own um, plastic bag bans or plastic straw bans. Um, I'm generally not a proponent of municipal preemption. I think municipalities to a large extent should be able to determine and shape their own future. There's some times where I, I, I think preemption makes sense uh, when you don't want to create too many sporadic kind of like, you know, individual laws, but in, when it comes to letting municipalities, um, you know, prohibit or, 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 you know, impose some sort of fee or fine for, you know, plastic bags or plastic straws. Uh, that's something that I'm okay with. I think each community can shape its own future in that regard. I would certainly vote against a bill that preempted municipalities from being able to pass their own plastic bag ban or plastic straw ban. Um, I think that if Philadelphia or Pittsburgh or Allentown or Bethlehem or any community for that matter, just wants to choose what they think is best for their residents and their own public health, I think that that's their prerogative. Um, just like I think municipalities should be able to set their own minimum wage and pass their own firearm regulations, I think when it comes to aspects of their environmental future, um, we should, uh, you know, especially when it comes to plastic bags, I'm okay with letting municipalities, you know, determine um, what their constituents feel uh, is important in that respect. Um, so I, I would, you know, I would not vote to preempt municipalities from, you know, passing a plastic bag ban or a plastic straw ban. Um, that's, I think, perhaps where the legislature can play the biggest role. Um, and I think, you know, encouraging municipalities or giving them guidance on that, uh, that that's sort of where I'm coming at it from. Um, I'm not familiar with what else, you know, if there is state legislation, to be honest, it's an area where I would gladly, you know, sort of be educated and be open to a conversation on. Um, I can't say I'm any really more informed on it than the issue of preemption. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree with uh, Representative Siegel. I mean, that, that's definitely something I'd want to learn more about how we can help from the state level. Um, I know Allentown considered it a couple of years ago. I, I don't know what ever came of that, but I know certain stores like Wegmans over in the west end of Allentown recently uh, removed them and went to brown bags. And so some of the companies have, um, but there's definitely a lot of single use plastics out there still being used. So definitely an area where we can improve drastically. Well, folks, I can certainly share this too as a, a volunteer at the advisory council. Kyle, I see you nodding your head. That is certainly an ordinance that we are looking to put into place, but there are other um, issues to consider such as uh, who financially who bears the brunt of it and how can we provide ethical solutions to do the least amount of, again, financial, provide the least amount of financial impact on folks who might be burdened. So if you are interested in that, um, Look at your environmental advisory council and see what ordinance they're pushing and also um, how, how you can support that. So I was really excited to see that question. And I, as somebody who, uh, who volunteers on it, it's actually really exciting to hear your support. So I appreciate that from a very personal. So fantastic. Okay, from Tamar. Obtaining grants to retrofit schools and other municipal buildings using passive has, I'm so sorry, I'm probably saying that wrong, design principles will kill two birds with one stone for climate impact, long-term cost of maintenance, utilities, and indoor air quality. We can look at, can we look at, uh, at ways of investing in this? So this passive haws, and I, Tamar, I apologize if I am butchering that pronunciation, um, but can we essentially invest in them? So I'm, I'm not personally familiar with the, the passive, I think it's house, because I clicked on that link. Um, we'll, we'll definitely look at that and, and just kind of based on what, I, what I'm seeing real quickly, it's the Pennsylvania Housing Finance Agency, I think pro providing additional incentives to increased home energy ratings and geothermal systems. Um, so definitely something that we're interested in as we've seen through the, like our housing crisis, we've 
been seeing not just in the Lea Valley, but across the United States, truly. Um, we're, we're supporting some local projects with those tax credits. Um, so that's definitely something that we'll, we'll look into and hopefully apply to those programs. Thank you. Okay. From Jeff, we have the traffic from pa passenger vehicles and from trucks gets heavier every year. Um, along with that comes increased air pollution, runoff of petroleum and plastic from runways and noise. What is being done to plan for and promote increased public transportation that is efficient enough to incentivize people to use it? Great question. I can uh, I can jump on that pretty. Uh, um, I've had some really good conversations uh, with with Becky Bradley, who's the head of the Planning Commission here, um, and I can tell you one of the things I'm particularly interested in, um, and it's it's an ambitious goal, but it's something I think the Valley needs to seriously consider and pursue. Uh, is ensuring transit access from here to Philadelphia through connection to SEPTA. Um, and I know that the Planning Commission is in a, there's a study right now with PennDOT to determine whether or not uh, that we would have sufficient passenger traffic and that we as a region would sort of qualify um, and be in the running uh, for potential uh, assistance, both federally and state, to make that connection. There's been a lot of conversations about extending SEPTA service to Quakertown. So from there, it's not much more of a stretch to get it to somewhere like Lower Saucon or Allentown. And in order to do that, uh, one of the conversations, one of the things I've talked about with with uh, Becky Bradley is that we are the only state in the country that prohibits its transit authorities and its metro uh, metropolitan planning organizations from using local taxing referendum to finance really important infrastructure investments. So if we want to make critical investments in public transit, like regional rail or connecting ourselves to larger state transit systems, we need the ability locally to make those investments. And so one of the things I want to push in Harrisburg, and I serve on the Transportation Committee, that's one of the committees I've been assigned to, is, is providing transit authorities uh, like Lanta or municipal planning organizations like LVPC the ability to go to voters and ask them if they're willing to temporarily pay you know, an increase in the sales tax or a small increase in the personal income tax uh, to invest in specific transit-oriented projects. Uh, it's not a blank check and it's not a lump sum of money for a generic use. They're project-specific. Um, and generally speaking, around the country, transit-related referendums usually pass about 85% of the time. They're genuinely very popular. Um, and it's a way for our region to chart its own course and not necessarily be beholden or you know, worried about securing state or federal grants. Um, and so if that study comes back in a really um, uh, you know, optimistic sort of fashion, and it says that you know, we do in fact qualify and that we would benefit from that connection. We in the Valley really need to be in a place to make sure that we can move expeditiously. Um, I think transit access to Philadelphia would be a boon for the Lehigh Valley um, from a job standpoint, from an economic uh, you know, justice standpoint, and also from a development standpoint. Um, you know, the King of Prussia line is being built right now by SEPTA. And the beautiful thing about public transit is that um, it makes development that much more uh, sustainable. It reduces our reliance on automobiles, which cuts down on that congestion. Um, and it allows us to build communities um, and, and create economic opportunity um, in a very concentrated fashion um, and allow folks to get to and from where they need to be um, and, and access jobs that they previously didn't have access to, all the while contributing to a more sustainable future. Um, I'm a big train person. I, I think the United States doesn't invest enough in its rail lines. Um, personally, I'd love to see a high-speed rail line all across the country, but I think here in the Commonwealth, um, we can do a lot to stitch together our most populous region, which is the Southeast. Um, the Lehigh Valley is really just an extension of the collar counties in many ways. And if we can integrate the collar counties in Philadelphia, I think we can not only create a really economically vibrant future for our residents, um, but we can create one that is a lot less automobile dependent. Um, and we can do a lot of transit oriented development, which is phenomenal. That means a lot of dense housing right on the rail line, uh, which would be great for residents of Lehigh Valley. Um, especially historically disadvantaged communities in Allentown, um, you know, who are reliant on Lanta, which isn't always, you know, the, the bus routes are very long, sometimes they take an hour and a half to get where you need to go. Um, the train system would be much more reliable and it would connect them to better paying jobs all across the Southeast. So that's one of the things I'm interested in working on from a legislative perspective. And it's also something that's sort of already in discussion from a planning standpoint. Um, you know, like I said, it's ambitious. But we need to have those conversations. The valley is growing fast. We'll probably have a million residents before the end of 2040. Um, so we need to make sure that we're building a transit system, especially a public transit system, that is going to be capable of responding to and enduring that level of population growth. Um, or we're going to have a traffic jam on 22, uh, the likes of which we've really never seen. 
And thank you for that, Representative Siegel. I appreciate that one. And thinking you had made a note um, that actually flows into um, this uh, this next question uh, quite well. It's you know how are we planning to include equity in our sustainable development plans? Um, Matt, Senator, if you want to jump on it, or would you like? Yeah, I mean, for, for, for me personally, in terms of like long term planning, it starts with education. Uh, that, that's why I'm a big proponent of the level up program. We introduced a bill uh, to add $400 million in the level up, which goes to the, the 100 poorest school districts across the, the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. Uh, and when you want to talk about equity, it's that investment in those poorest districts that don't have the property values. Uh, that some other school districts may have in the suburbs. And one thing I will point out is that it's not just the, the urban, it's the rural school districts as well that are uh, struggling financially. And I think the biggest uh, inequity right now across the United States, but specifically here in the, in the Commonwealth is education funding. Uh, and, and so that's something that we'll continue to fight for. Um, and it kind of all circles back into um, if you invest in someone, you, you give them the foundation with that education to be able to be a uh, responsible uh, civilian moving forward. Um, so that's something that where, where I look, how we, how we can help in my office is, is truly investing in education. Like today, we saw the court ruling uh, this past month that's unjust and unconstitutional. So in, in all the planning, we must invest in education. Absolutely. And with this investment in our education, which again, I, I absolutely love because we want to make sure our children are prepared to compete in a global competitive market and um, be able to be a part of this new green and in, in green infrastructure jobs that they, again, they, they have that ability. Does this include not just traditional, but does this include technical VOTEC schools as well? Yes, it, it must. And, and uh, Governor Shapiro is, has been a big proponent of workforce investment, um, and especially in that CTE realm. Uh, yesterday, we were at L-Tri-C and LCTI. And looking at the, the programs they are offering, uh, you know, is it electrical, mechanical engineering, um, you know, making sure that our students that want to take that option have all the resources they need uh, to, to be able to go out right out of the workforce. So definitely in the Votech and, and LCTI world. Appreciate that. And, and one thing I'll add there, I mean, I, I would love to, you know, right now we're busing our, those students up to Schnecksville. And, I'll, and that serves a, a very large majority of, of Allentown residents. Um, would love to see more of that innovation and, and education in downtown, right where that where where the those communities live. Absolutely, absolutely. I appreciate that one. Question from Larry: Is there a plan for the local municipalities to do public sewer lateral? Uh, inspections to avoid I and I inflow and infiltration out of our sewer systems and overloading overloading the sewer treatment plant. So I can add it and Representative Seal, you can jump in then. Uh, just when I was talking about that plan, 10 year plan that the, the county is looking at, um, they have done a study where we're, we're starting to push those limits. And, and if you're familiar with Klein Island and Allentown, we, we need investment there to make sure that's not happening. So we're definitely pushing a breaking point. And that's why it's it's come up with our municipalities, like South Whitehall, I think was the first one that mentioned it to me um, that, you know, we're looking at this cliff here that we're going to overload our system with all this development um, and we need to get ahead of it. Yeah, um, I think you know, Senator Miller is absolutely right. Uh, that as a former council member, one of the things we dealt with quite a bit was the Lehigh County Authority. Um, which is the you know primary water provider to mo a lot you know many municipalities in Lehigh Valley, particularly Lehigh County, um, and they've had a number of conversations about building a second wastewater treatment facility because of the level of development that the valley has experienced, so that they can keep up with demand. And that's an expensive endeavor. And I think when we talk about equity and environmental sustainability, one that would be passed on to ratepayers if the state you know doesn't play a role in helping make that major infrastructure investment. Um, and the other aspect is uh, you know when it comes to inflow and infiltration. You know, the city of Allentown, I can tell you, has made tens of millions of dollars in capital investments in improving its existing sewer system. Uh, you know, we have 100 year old pipes underneath the ground. Um, that's an expensive endeavor for a city like Allentown to do. Um, and we have, you know, pursued a number of innovation, you know, innovative, you know, ways of fixing those sewer lines. We've had, you know, the inflatable piping that we put through. 
Um, there's a lot of great systems out there, uh, but they're very expensive. Um, and I think this is another area where, you know, there's expectations, there's mandates, there's environmental requirements for cities and townships, um, you know, especially from the federal government. And the problem is that a lot of those mandates get passed on to local taxpayers, often through, you know, property tax, which is very regressive um, and, you know, and, and hurts a lot of low income folks. So I think any time, I think, you know, the city of Allentown, especially it has a lot of lead pipes. Um, we want to make sure we're making those infrastructure investments as the Commonwealth. Um, we've got to make sure that we're not passing them on to municipalities without the state being a partner. Um, you know, I think it was a few years ago, it was, you know, Allentown, especially our kids, uh, you know, had a high level of lead uh, in their blood. Um, part of that is drinking water, um, you know, and in order and part of it is lead paint in homes, but a huge portion of it is also the fact that we have a lot of old lead pipes um, and a lot of old water infrastructure under the ground. And we just don't have the capacity individually to address that um, unless we are given, you know, more robust taxing capacity as a municipality or the state of Pennsylvania starts to make, you know, sizable infrastructure investments, um, you know, on an annual basis uh, that are directed towards those core infrastructure priorities, specifically hard infrastructure. And, and Josh, if I may interject for a second, about 62% of our older house and our housing stock in the Allentown area has lead in lead in the household, and it's right. lead paint. And when he did have something called the Whole Homes Repair Act that was passed, but that's looking like about 80 projects, which isn't a bad start, um, but that's 80 projects for uh, home remediations for homeowners. So we'll need something in the future for not just homeowners, but for renters as well. And as far as the uh, uh, lead piping um, in lead, excuse me, water water pipe, lead piping in the in the water systems, um, that Lisa with the uh, Water Authority is certainly working on that. And there are grants that are available, but there's there's lead piping that we're not even that we don't even have accounted for yet. So that's a that's a major a major concern, and we can certainly use more investment in that. Yeah, I mean, just I, I agree with that. I mean, we, we are uh, one one thing is identifying which houses have the the lead pipe. Uh, I think that's going to be very challenging because you know, obviously you can't see the pipes until you have a homeowner go in and um, you know, working with some of our staff or our team uh, to understand how, how do people actually test it? I mean, do you use a magnet, a magnet on the, um, the pipe coming in, your main uh, water line? Or, um, so understanding that so that we can you know, help the city of Allentown and other municipalities uh, invest in um, remediating, remediating those and replacing them um, so it's definitely something that's on our radar. And, and if we can step up, you know, one thing I was just looking at some grants we did announce today um, was a $200,000 for the uh, Lehigh County Authority uh, for exactly what we were just talking about. It, it was for um, infiltration and, and updating the stormwater uh, system. It, it's a small drop in the bucket, but um, I, I think it's a, a good initial start um, in this round. And, and we're going to be hosting a, a grants luncheon for some of our municipalities and nonprofits to understand how do you actually apply for the grant? How does that system work? Um, and what are ways we're gonna bring in a couple of folks from Harrisburg to uh, you know, really run that, that program and understand you know, what the true need is in the Lehigh Valley. So just wanted to add that in there. That's, what I know. That's amazing, I love to hear that. Okay, folks, we have time for about maybe two more questions. I love, I love the engagement. Um, so, uh, what concrete plans uh, do you have to encourage clean energy, promote electric vehicles, and shift away from plastics? Uh, well, I, so I'll talk about, uh, so I, as, as a member of the Transportation Committee, uh, I, there's a tremendous amount of federal grants coming down for the deployment of electric vehicle charging stations. Um, I think one of the things that we want to do if we want to lay the groundwork for making, uh, you know, giving, giving electric vehicles a larger market share is we need to make sure that people can reliably commute from one place to the next without, uh, you know, uh, forgive me for forgetting the term, uh, range anxiety. Uh, if, you know, worried that they won't be able to charge their car in a convenient fashion uh, or, you know, be able to get from point A to point B um, and not, you know, run out of power and sort of be stranded. So um, I think, you know, if we want to encourage more electric vehicles, encourage more folks to, you know, to purchase them, we need to also make sure that the literal infrastructure is in place to facilitate um, that kind of market mindset. 
Um, I also think, uh, you know, the state can do more to incentivize solarization of households, uh, you know, providing grants and, and assistance to help folks solarize their homes. Um, you know, I think we can have a conversation about what community solar looks like, uh, or, you know, or decentralized solar system, uh, you know, or, or decentralized energy systems. That's definitely an, an interesting conversation. And I, I think one we need to, you know, sort of discuss. Um, but I do think that at least in the meantime, we can certainly help individual homeowners um, you know, solarize their homes in a larger extent. We can deploy infrastructure, especially along core transit, you know, corridors, highways, uh, you know, our interstates, making sure that folks can, you know, travel via electric vehicle without range anxiety. Um, you know, we can help our municipalities, uh, you know, more tangibly plan for the future um, and make sure that they've got, you know, modern strategic, you know, water retention plans and, you know, to reduce stormwater runoff. Uh, and, and as we talked about earlier, uh, most importantly, I think this really gets down to zoning planning and how we choose to develop our communities. Uh, I think the most important thing we can do to build an environmentally sustainable commonwealth and protect the Lehigh Valley is get a handle on this growth because, uh, you know, the valley is growing at an expeditious rate. Uh, that's not going to stop. Um, we're a place that people want to live, and it, rightfully so. It's a beautiful place, and maintaining that quality of life is important. Um, but I think the most important thing we can do, the most tangible thing, um, is to change the nature of development. And that means, you know, not chewing up our open land so we can build large suburban sprawling housing complexes. Uh, you know, it means, you know, for example, Ridge Farms in South Whitehall is a, is a really nice development. Uh, it was a density overlay district, um, but it's going to be very walkable. It's right along Walbert Avenue. Um, you know, here in Allentown, the waterfront is a great example of a dense walkable community. The state hospital property is going to be another tremendous opportunity to create a mixed use, really sustainable community. Um, I think that's the most important thing we can do um, is prevent the Lehigh Valley from making the mistakes of the past that so many other places have made with, you know, robust growth. We have a chance to get it right. Uh, we have a chance to make sure that we build um, with with people in mind and, 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 you know, how communities are shaped by that. Um, and I think that those are the sort of things that will ultimately make our, our, in the long run, you know, our, our community much more sustainable because the better we build, the more dense we build, the more walk we build, the easier it is for public transit to come into play. The easier it is for folks to ride their bike or take an e-scooter, you know, the, the easier it is for people to choose multimodal forms of transportation other than an automobile. Um, so I think those are important. The more we sprawl, the more irresponsibly we grow, the harder it is to make those other reforms make sense um, because you just, you can't work backwards. You're yeah, absolutely agree. right. Agreed, yes. And, and just want to add one more thing is the uh, Governor Shapiro has talked about increasing by 2030, our requirement to uh, the 30% of our renew our energy will come from renewable energy by 2030. That's that's the goal. Um, so I look forward to, to working on, with that. I. I you know, I think it's great. I believe 13% right now that our energy comes from is mandated to come from renewable energy and going to the 30% by 2030. Obviously, you want to have it higher than that, you know, but just I think realistically, he's setting a, a realistic goal. Um, so anything that, you know, I can do from the Senate and working with our colleagues in the House uh, to make sure that happens um, and then incentivizing those uh, solar fields and uh, wind fields that so those energy sources are there. Absolutely, I appreciate that. Well, folks, we have one last question. Um, so how can we as your constituents help to continue to support environmental protection here in the Lehigh Valley and beyond? I go ahead, Representative Siegel, do you want to jump? No, in? no, no, go ahead. No, go ahead, Senator. I, I, I think that it would so the, I, the reason I put that invitation out there when I first started is because I truly want to hear the different ideas we have that we can come together and, and work on. I, if, so for me personally, it's sitting down with the, the individual groups on this call to understand uh, where they're coming from and how we can we can help from a Senate side, working with the House and the governor. Um, so for, for me personally, so it's sitting down and continue to, to learn. I'm here to have the conversations and to spend the time. You know, Josh and I are both are very young and we're hopefully gonna be here for a good amount of time. We can plan for the future. How do we sustainably move away from those uh, dirty energy sources? We're here to have the conversations, we're here to help. So please reach out and, and we can sit down and talk about it more. Appreciate it. Yeah, and I would say the same thing, uh, you know, be present and active. You know, our, I think we, I don't, you know, I think both Senator Miller and I are committed to being open and, and always having, you know, in a, 
being willing to sit down and, and learn and, and, you know, figure out, you know, how we can best lead on any issue. Um, but I would also say if, you know, like for sustainability in the Valley is be involved in, in your local communities. Um, I see a, que a question or a concern about housing, um, you know, low-income housing or building housing in general. Housing is another tremendous contributor to, you know, climate change and in and, and our carbon footprint. Housing is a huge energy consumer. Uh, but a lot of these decisions, uh, you know, are made at the local level. Um, and local communities have a tremendous role to play in sustainability. Like I think I talked about zoning, housing development, public transit. Um, you know, a lot of these decisions are made in city hall and a lot of these decisions can be made on the school board as well in terms of how we build those school buildings. Um, we're here to help as representatives. We want to make sure the state is an equal participant. Um, but I think it also helps when we have an active body of concerned citizens on the ground. Um, you know, it only takes a few dedicated folks to change the course of action in local municipalities. Uh, um, I really believe that. And you can see it sometimes in the inverse, you know, anytime there's a new housing development, for you know, 10, 10 people will show up and say, don't build it. And sometimes that's enough. And that's the sad part is, uh, you know, a few folks can make a difference sometimes in the negative, but a lot of really active, engaged and well-meaning folks can also change the world, um, especially at the local level. Um, and I, I would, you know, I would encourage you one to, you know, continue to be active with us, hold us accountable, meet with us, you know, uh, push us to lead on certain issues. And, but most importantly, you know, tell us where we can be helpful in terms of supporting your local communities you know, get involved in the borough and township or, you know, city that you live in, um, you know, ask to be on the Environmental Advisory Council. If one doesn't exist, try to form it. Um, there are a lot of really powerful things you can do at the local level, and you can make a difference because it's, it's, some, it's I can tell you, it's easier to get consensus amongst seven than it is amongst 203. Um, you know, it, you, you can get consensus from your local community. You can push things forward. And I think the state, our role is to be a partner is to make sure that, you know, as a state, we're putting resources behind these priorities, uh, but we need the mindset shift on the ground in our own backyard uh, so that we have folks that we can work with, so. Thank you. All right, well, folks, thank you. Thank you all. Thank you everyone for making this just such a wonderful and educational evening. Of course, uh, Representative Siegel, Senator Miller, thank you for making time during, I know, a very chaotic and hectic schedule to join us tonight. We really appreciate uh, just being able to engage and just pick your brain on just these really complicated but important issues. And just another thank you to our co-sponsors, Penn Future, Penn Environment and Democracy for All. Um, just just to note folks, please keep an eye out on your inbox for the recording for this event and further information on how you can protect the environment. Um, there's certainly a lot going on between our different organizations and the work that needs to be done in Harrisburg. So again, I cannot thank you enough for your dedication and I hope that we can continue to lift the environmental voices in the Lehigh Valley. So again, Thank you so much and thank you all for just making this an absolutely wonderful evening. Thank, Good thanks. night, everyone. Good night. Thank you. Thanks everyone, have a good night.